More than 30 species of migratory birds usually pass through Singapore every year. They stop by to feed and rest before continuing their journey to breeding grounds as far north as the Arctic Circle. But this year, the number of migratory shorebirds has fallen to an all-time low, and that's according to the bird, bird census by the Nature Society Singapore. And Dr. Yong Ding Li from the Society joins us uh, with more on this. So let's talk about the number of the... Mm -hmm. Or specifically the shorebird species. Uh, tell us a bit about sort of the decline in numbers we're seeing there. Well, for the case of Singapore, we are seeing quite large declines of many kinds of shorebirds. So, for instance, a number of shorebirds that were, you know, fairly common, say, 10 years, 20 years ago, uh, things like the Pacific Golden Plover has now really dropped to some of the lowest numbers we have recorded, you know, in recent history. Uh, and that trend seems to be quite consistent across many of our migratory bird species as well. Yeah. Well, 10, 20 years is not a long period, long ago. I mm, mean, this is a very recent, very rapid decline. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, startling decline. And uh, Pacific, the Pacific Golden Plover is just one of the many other species that have showed such a, a big decline. Uh, we are also seeing similar patterns of uh, drop in numbers across many other countries in Asia. So this is quite a, a persistent pattern across uh, this part of the world. Oh, if you're talking about the Pacific Golden Plover uh, specifically, it used to be the most common migratory bird in Singapore. Mm -hmm. Nearly a quarter of a century ago, almost 1,700 mm -hmm. were spotted here. In 2005, there were still more than 1,000. And now it's mm -hmm. dropped to zero. Uh, it's really been quite drastic. What, what, what's been the cause of such a drastic change? It's, it's, quite a, it's quite a sad story because I remember when I was uh, you know, in primary school and I went bird watching. I would see that, you know, there'll be thousands of Pacific Golden Plovers, you know, but just like two weeks ago when I went back to Sungai Bulo, there were just like a handful of them yeah. around. So that change is really big. And uh, part of the reason why we think this, this species has dropped so much is because uh, uh, of its migratory habit, habit. So these birds, they breed in the, in the high Arctic uh, of Asia. And uh, as they fly towards the tropical countries, they would have to stop over at different wetlands along the way in China, in Vietnam to rest and eat to refuel on their journey. But, you know, we know that the uh, economic development is, you know, pushing ahead quite quickly and large parts of the, the wetlands that they depend on across Asia are now being converted to um, industrial land, to, to fish farms. So you can say that a lot of these migratory water birds are, are losing the places that they need to, to feed. So, um, and that means that their journeys are tougher uh, and many of them, they don't make it. So the numbers that we see here is a reflection of mm. the, the pressures that the uh, populations are being, being put on. And is this across the board and across all species, or are some species doing relatively well? I think uh, we can say that this, this decline pattern is quite uh, general ac across many of our migratory water birds, but there are a couple of species that are not showing that stark a decline uh, as well. So, um, but broadly, you can say that many of our migratory birds are in trouble in Asia. Uh, I think the, the, what, a particular species, the red mm. shanks, have sort of bucked the trend. Um, there's been an increase in their number, mm -hmm. uh, which is what uh, Steve mm -hmm. was just referring to a little bit earlier. Um, we're seeing mm -hmm. them rise. What was behind this increase? Well, for the case of the common red shank in Singapore, uh, we believe that their population has not been as affected as the, the changes in the environment in, in parts of Asia, partly because um, you know, the red shanks, they come from different parts of Asia. Mm -hmm. So for those uh, shorebirds that tend to fly in from the eastern part of Asia, they concentrate along a, a particular coastline of China and Korea. Those, those shorebirds are really hard hit. But the red shank, you know, we have them uh, living in the, in the highlands of Tibet. Tibet. They are also in Mongolia. And because you have the population that's more spread out across Asia, um, the, the impact on them from development is, is going to be more spread out as well. So I, I do believe that it's because of this, this geographical spread of the species that has mm. kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, slowed down its decline. And tell us a bit about the, uh, an unusual sighting, perhaps. Uh, Asian open bill storks mm -hmm. are spotted in crunchy marshes. That's uh, right. mm -hmm. that's, how unusual is that, and, and what do you put it down to? Well, the um, Asian open bill stork is a bird that you know, we, we've never before observed in Singapore until in the early 2010s. And typically, it's a bird that's found in the northern parts of Southeast Asia. So you can see them to be very common birds in Thailand, Cambodia, in Laos, for example. But uh, we think that this year, uh, we've got a really dry season, an unusually dry season that has afflicted many parts of Southeast Asia. And you see, these stocks, they, 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 they feed largely on water snails that live in the paddy fields. So as all these paddy fields dry up, um, they are suffering from 
uh, you know, less food sources, and I believe that it's uh, probably the reason why flocks of these stocks are uh, forced to disperse or to fly further away from where they traditionally would be found. Mm. Uh, and that brings some of them to Singapore. So that's the situation surrounding shorebirds. Uh, what about uh, migratory birds that are not shorebirds? Mm -hmm. uh, kingfishers, for example, we've seen mm -hmm. a couple of them here yes, as well. Yes. So broadly speaking, across Asia, most, or should I say, a, a large proportion of our migratory birds are, are in decline. And sometimes it may not be you know, uh, detected in the surveys that we do in Singapore. I know some of our colleagues in Korea and in Japan they have done surveys themselves and they found that some of the migratory birds that they have that, that live in the forests of Korea and Japan uh, have shown great declines and they attributed uh, part of that to the loss of habitat in Southeast Asia. Uh, but by and large, I think we are still you know, not having uh, enough uh, data for many of these species and that means that uh, you know, in the coming years, we need to make sure that our science is there uh, to continue to monitor this migratory bird species to better understand their decline. Uh, another challenge is that many of these birds, they are really small and it's very hard for us to put trackers to track their migration. So the technology is not quite there, but it's coming in very quickly. So it may be that in, you know, in a couple of years from now, we are able to better monitor the, the migration of these small little birds and understand better why they are in decline. Is it a difficult challenge to, uh, to, to readdress this and once the decline sort of sets in, is it, it's going to be a challenge to get the numbers up and ultimately mm -hmm whose responsibility does this fall to because by nature they migrate so yeah. which country really has to take the onus to, to try and ensure that these populations survive? Absolutely. So as you pointed out, uh, one of the biggest challenges we, we are faced when we are trying to, to conserve migratory birds is that many of these species they are spread over so many different countries. So trying to get people to conserve them, we need to get people from different parts of the world to work together. And this is one of the, the, the big challenges that we face. Uh, but fortunately, this is changing. And uh, technology is helping in some ways. But in recent years, there are more and more platforms available for us, uh, for conservationists, scientists from different countries to work more closely together. And that hopefully will help us to you know, find better ways to conserve migratory mm. birds. So just, just a quick final question. What is the impact on the environment or, mm. or ecological balance when we don't mm. have migratory birds stopping by as often as they used to? Mm. So broadly speaking for birds, birds are some of the most visible animals on the planet. So, and also because they are so closely linked to our ecosystem, uh, any change in the population of birds would also reflect broader changes in our ecosystem. So you could say that birds are, you know, technically, wild birds are technically uh, indicators or messengers of the state of our environment. And when we see declines in birds, we are also seeing, you know, huge changes in our environment. So having less birds out there means that we may not be able to do this as effectively. Uh, and then the second point is that many of these birds, they have very important roles. For example, some of these birds, they are helping us to disperse uh, seeds of certain plants. Some of these birds, they... Uh, have other important ecosystem roles as well. So when these birds decline, these ecological uh, uh, so roles, so to speak, are being lost from, from, from our ecosystems. All right, yeah. Ding Li, thanks very much for joining us this Pleasure. evening. Thanks for having me. Sharing your perspectives. We've Thank been you. speaking there with Dr. Yong Ding Li from the Nature Society of Singapore. Thank you.